We know that DA governments, such as those in the Western Cape, are already well ahead of the curve when it comes to the rollout of renewable energy programs. Uh, just the last speaker in the Western Cape, because you like behaving almost as if you're a government on your own. And you promised people of the Western Cape in 2023 in July that you're going to have more megawatts. You have not done that. So you should not behave like Western Cape is different from any other. But I'm not sweeping. Let me get to my speech. The come is Saturday. We will celebrate the 11-year anniversary of the People's Movement. We invite our people across the four corners of South Africa to come and celebrate with us in the Northern Cape. Um, Honorable Kennedy, once again, thank you for the invitation to the EFF birthday party. I don't know how big it's going to be now because there's less VBS money left to to fund it. (laughs) Deputy Minister Chabalala, please... um, I, I know you've got a bugbear in the Western Cape, but I'm going to ask you to please go and look at the Western Cape Energy Resilience Program. I'll get you a free copy. T- t- take your time to read it. I mean, are you, if you read as fast as you speak, you're never going to get it. Um, but Pacific. I now invite Honorable Brian. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, And good afternoon to you, to the Minister, Deputy Minister, and all members of the NCOP. The events of the past month have seen us enter a new stage in the life of our young democracy. And there's a great deal of excitement about what we will be able to achieve working together in the new government of national unity. As the Minister of Agriculture recently stated, we must all strive to be builders, not breakers. And as builders, we must remain resolute in our commitment to improving the lives of all South Africans by creating a society that is rich with opportunities. We must also recognize that in order to move forward, we will have to change the way that we've done certain things in the past. As a country which has built its energy infrastructure primarily around the extraction and burning of coal, we are now faced with perhaps our greatest challenge, the imminent threat of climate change and growing international pressure to transition away from fossil fuels towards renewable sources of energy. Now, let's be clear. South Africa is not the highest global emitter of carbon. That dubious honor goes to China, which contributes over 30% of global climate emissions. But while South Africa contributes only 1.1%, this is still by far the highest on the African continent. As signatories to the Paris Agreement, there's no room for finger-pointing. And we must play our part and move with the times, or we risk being left behind. I was very encouraged to hear the comments made by the President earlier this month at the Climate Resilience Symposium, where he said, and I quote, Indecision and slow action are not an option. We must act decisively and swiftly to mitigate the effects of climate change and ensure a just transition for all South Africans. We must pursue a green industrial agenda that will create jobs and grow the economy, close quote. Last week, we also saw the signing into law of the Climate Change Act, an important piece of legislation that was supported by the Western Cape Parliament. This act will require provinces and municipalities to develop their own strategies in order to adapt to and mitigate the impacts of climate change. This renewed commitment from the Government of National Unity towards transitioning away from fossil fuels is refreshing and is a clear sign of the positive impact that the GNU is already beginning to have. We know that DA governments, such as those in the Western Cape, are already well ahead of the curve when it comes to the rollout of renewable energy programs. And as I understand, our DA ministers and deputy ministers are already adding significant value to these important discussions. The Minister of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment, Dr. Dion George, has come out strongly to emphasize that he will make it its priority to implement the Just Energy Transition Plan, known as the JETP, with the financial support of our partners from the United Kingdom, the United States, Germany, France, Denmark, and the Netherlands. And I'm sure that the Honourable Minister Mantashi shares this enthusiasm towards achieving the goals of the JETP. And we look forward to seeing the billions of rands that have been committed finally being spent on transitioning towards a greener future. At present, there's still a degree of ambiguity as to which ministries will be responsible for ensuring that the just transition becomes a reality, and the role of mineral resources will no doubt be paramount. Everyone must do their bit to move with the times. That said, South Africans must also make sure that our voices are heard when it comes to the use of instruments such as the European Union's Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM, 
which could have a significant negative impact on developing economies such as our own if it's implemented without proper consultation and an appreciation of the challenges that we currently face. The reality is that even with this renewed and fantastic commitment towards increasing our renewable energy production, coal-based power will still be a significant part of our energy mix for many years to come. And the matter of common but differentiated responsibilities must be taken into consideration here. DA-led governments have not been sitting on our laurels, though, and we've already been contributing significantly towards a transition away from coal by helping to roll out renewable energy at pace in the areas where we govern. The DA-led Western Cape generated over 1,000 megawatts of clean energy last year and is on track to far exceed this in 2024. We'll be dramatically increasing the amount of renewable energy in the grid through groundbreaking joint initiatives with our DA-led local governments, such as the state-of-the-art solar PV project being planned for Riversdale. This small town, home to around 22,000 residents, has been the victim of load shedding over many years. This has posed risk to their local economy, primarily based around fruit and wine production, both of which require stable and reliable energy. This town is also home to beautiful beaches and picturesque scenery, and I look forward to seeing how local tourism will grow with a reliable energy source in place. Energy that doesn't come from burning a dirty, finite resource like coal, but from the sun, which, as I understand, is still good to go for about another five billion years. By harnessing the enormous solar potential in the Western Cape, the Riversdale Solar Project will generate an estimated 15 million kilowatt hours every year and will be capable of storing 10 megawatt hours of energy in lithium-ion batteries. Some of you may be familiar with the DA's commitment to create prosumers and we're delivering on this by ensuring that excess energy can be sold back into the grid. Added to this, the Western Cape will see the rollout of new solar farms in the Toshifir area and an extensive embedded solar project in Atlantis comprising of over 20,000 ground-mounted solar panels. This is exactly the type of commitment we must see from governments across the country if we are to achieve the transition away from coal and towards renewable energy. Yeah, yeah. The Western Cape has around 200 operational mines, which provide thousands of much-needed jobs. Our province is blessed with a variety of minerals, including some of the most significant deposits of uranium, located mainly in the Karoo region. One of our primary responsibilities at all times must be the protection of our natural environment from unregulated and illegal mining and the catastrophic consequences that this can have. We're aware of environmental concerns that have been raised about mining in areas along our west coast in particular. And the Western Cape government, under the leadership of Minister Bridell, is doing its best to address these concerns where and when they arise. The DA has been clear in our own energy policy that all current mining operations, as well as the exploration and prospecting for new resources, should be managed according to strict environmental regulations and monitored accordingly. It is possible to balance the need for economic growth and job creation with the protection of our ecosystems and our biodiversity. There, however, can be no room for cutting corners when it comes to compliance. And we must ensure that the maintenance and rehabilitation of mining areas is prioritized. South Africa is blessed with rich and abundant mineral resources, which must be utilized to the benefit of all our people. We cannot and must not allow our precious resources to be exploited for the benefit of a connected few. Those who wish to break South Africa desire a return to the days of dodgy tenders and get-rich-quick schemes. And we've seen what a broken system looks like in provinces like Mpumalanga, where coal mafias have a stranglehold connected with organized crime syndicates that cause destruction and devastation in our communities. And one only has to do a quick Google search to see some familiar names popping up. As builders of a new South African government, we must resist these destructive forces at every turn if we wish to see our economy grow and the lives of all South Africans improve. As we enter a new era, we must be ready and willing to embrace change while ensuring that no back door is left open for those who wish to take us backwards. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Honorable Member. I take this opportunity and invite the Deputy Minister Mineral Resources and Energy to come and address the House. Thank you so much, Chairperson uh, of the National Council of Provinces, Mr. Freelum Mutsweni, Zipane, Minister of Minerals and Petroleum Resources, Mr. Gwede, Samson Mantaja, and members of the NCOP, um, including, of course, the Chairperson of the Select Committee, Mr. Pons Mutise. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, just the last speaker, as you were speaking about the energy and, and matters that we are speaking about, one thing that you left to also say is that in the Western Cape, because you like behaving almost as if you're a government of, on your own, um, there's a national government as much as of, uh, of local, of government of unity. It is quite important that there's one police and there was one president and that's where we're all marshaled. So the appetite for you to behave like you've got your own ministers, you're going to do your own policy, there's one policy direction of the government and that should be understood. So when you speak about electricity supply in the Western Cape, you must also acknowledge that who supplies that electricity, it is still as 25% of electricity that's where you generate as much as you're speaking about other sources. So I thought it's quite important. You promised people of the Western Cape in 2023 in July that you're going to have more megawatts. You have not done that. So you should not behave like Western Cape is different from any other. But I'm not sweeping. Let me get to my speech. We reject this budget, Honorable. That does not take into consideration the lives of ordinary South Africans. Finally, Chairperson, uh, this year marks 11 years since the formation of the economic freedom fighters, the only weapon in the hands of our people and the only voice of the oppressed and marginalized. It has been 11 years of unbroken struggle alongside with the widows, children, and dependents of our black brothers who were massacred in Marikana under the instruction of South Africa's sitting president, alongside mining communities across the country who have not seen any development and employment. The coming Saturday, we will celebrate the 11-year anniversary of the People's Movement. We invite mine workers, mining communities, and our people across the four corners of South Africa to come and celebrate with us at AR Abbas Sports Ground, Kimberley, in the Northern Cape. I, think. I now call upon the Honorable Baranost. Honorable Baranost, you have four minutes. Should be five minutes because uh, the Honourable Minister Chabalala took one of my minutes. Um, Honourable Chairperson, Honourable oh, That Minister, was under the previous administration, not this one. Honourable <laughs> Chairperson, Honourable... You just took away four seconds. Honourable Minister, Deputy Minister, Honourable Members and, and fellow South Africans, good day. Um, Honourable Minister Mantashe, the main issue with fossils is that they, 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 fossils tend to hang around just like a bad habit. They disrupt, they impede and they stifle growth. Take, for example, fossil fuels. Like Honourable Brian said earlier from the Western Cape, South Africa is reported to be amongst the top 15 largest emitters of carbon dioxide worldwide and the highest in Africa. The stubborn refusal to move from uh, fossil fuels to renewable energy is causing South Africa to warm at twice the global rate. And we should expect with global warming there will be changes in weather patterns. And I think we've experienced, um, especially in arid areas, extreme heat, like we've had a few years ago, and now we've got extreme um, rain. So weather patterns will be influenced by global warming, um, as has been scientifically proven. Um, Honorable Kennedy, once again, thank you for the invitation to the EFF birthday party. I don't know how big it's going to be now, because there's less VBS money left to, to fund it. Um, Deputy Minister Chabalala, please... Um, I, I know you've got a bugbear in the Western Cape, but I'm going to ask you to please go and look at the Western Cape Energy Resilience Program. I'll get you a free copy. 
Th take your time to read it. I mean, you, if you read as fast as you speak, you're never going to get it. Um, but specifically look at specifically look at the cost of stage four load shedding in the Western Cape because we made those calculations. It costs uh, the Western Cape 43 million rand a day. So we we are we ha we ha at stage four load shedding. We have to move away from ESCOM monopoly monopolized power, and we have to start looking at, at generating our own power and making our own plan. And I and I really hope that you take that plan and take it to the other provinces because it's a really good plan. Thank you, Minister. Honourable Makuna, thank you so much for that history lesson. It's about as useful as an unsalted pretzel. Um, the, constitutional, the Constitution gave you a right to come and speak here and say what you said, so we let it go. But remember that that Constitution is the one that you are trying to get rid of. So just embrace it and everything will be fine. Yeah. Honorable Modise, oh, that uh, committee report that you delivered for us. I'm so glad you're still here. It was riveting, the committee report that you gave us the chair. Um, it actually wasn't. It was about as useful as an Astro and a motorcycle. Because you didn't say anything about what the committee work did. You spoke about historical events. And you went on about, and on and on. So my advice to you in the spirit of the GNU, please, Honorable Mudise, please don't be bitter. Just get better. So, Minister, Minister, please, exploration permits, the 442 billion rand contributed to the economy, economy you spoke about with the minerals. Please, we need ex exploration permits. Um, three quarters of the way through the financial year, the department had received 2,525 applications for mining rights and permits, including presumably for exploration rights, and the department was unable to finalize any of those exploration permits. Not one, not even one out of 2,525. Let us look at what John Wooden said when he said, failure isn't fatal, but failure to change will be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.